Hey everybody, welcome to The Penalty Box. That's the new name for the podcast, so The Penalty Box, brought to you every Wednesday. Okay, so, in this week's episode, um, I plan to talk about, obviously, Bill Peters and Bob, um, Bobcock? Mike Babcock? I'm going to talk about, um, I'm not going to go into too much depth. I was planning to do a little bit more in depth on this, but... I think I'm just going to give a basic, my opinion on it, that's all. Uh, I'll tell you what I what happened, basically, and then I'll give you my opinion. Um, I want to talk about the Habs defense, what to do. I have a fix that I, um, I, I watch a guy named, uh, watch and read, Brian Wild. He's a local guy here in Montreal, and uh, I like his idea for what to do. So I want to bring that to you guys. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, there's talk again about firing everybody, trading everybody, uh, firing Mark Bergevin. Not for trades that he's made and mistakes he's made, but for trades he hasn't made. That's the new thing on Twitter. Uh, he didn't do this and he didn't do that, so we're going to talk about that. Um, along those lines, uh, Shane Gossesbeer is on the market, and I want to talk about that. Also talk about firings. Julian's name is brought up. I want to talk about that. Uh, I just want to talk quickly about Nick Suzuki. Just one specific aspect of Nick, Nick Suzuki that I want to talk about. Hang on, I got a cough and I don't want to do it on. The beauty of video, you can pause. So just one specific thing about Nick Suzuki I want to talk about. I want to do F- Habs fandom on, on uh, Brandon Gallagher. Just want to talk about him for a minute. I want to talk about this young team that Montreal has and about what our expectations maybe should be and shouldn't be. And finally, Carey Price. Is he to blame for this last five-game losing streak? Okay, so that's what I want to do. And then there's a warning. There's a big warning because F-bombs may be dropped during the recording of this podcast. If I drop an F-bomb, I apologize in advance. There's some emotional things here. might happen. (coughs) <coughs> well, there, I coughed. I couldn't block that out. Okay. Bill Peters, coach of the Calgary Flames, at least as of the time I'm recording this. And I'm recording this. It is right now, as I'm talking, just before 6 o'clock local time in Montreal. Um, honestly, before this story broke... T- did I even know who Bill Peters was? Honestly, I would say I didn't. I didn't know who was coaching the Flames, honestly. That's not... I don't know if that looks good or bad on me, because I talk about hockey all the time. I make videos. But yes, I talk about the Habs, so I don't. I didn't know who the coach was. I didn't know who he was. So I heard all of this. And then I heard what... Well, like I heard there was controversy about him, and then I heard what it was about. And then there was a second story... On top of the first one. Now, the first one I heard about was um, uh, Aliou, Akeem Aliou, um, where he said that when he was a member of the Rockford, uh, I don't even know what, the, the AHL club, back in 2000, I think this happened in the 2009-10 season. Um, you know, uh, they play music in the locker rooms. I guess they're playing hip-hop. It's the only thing I can figure what the music was, because what he did call it was, apparently, Peters had screamed out that I'm, I'm, I'm tired or sick of that N-word shit. Uh, referring to the music. Are you guys listening to that N-word shit? And then later, apparently, say, repeating the uh, N-word twice, directed not exactly at Aliu, who obviously is a is a black player, uh, but if I were him and my coach was saying those words, well, it's obviously directed at me, and I got to take it personally. So I don't know how if Peters wants to deny that he meant it personally. Well, I don't know how you can deny that, and I'm not saying he denied that. I don't. I'm not putting words in the mouth. But so these are the allegations, racial slurs, um, and it happened almost ten, well, about ten years ago. It's coming out now because of the Mike Babcock stuff and everything. And, and so he was, I think he just said something on Twitter about, oh, well, that's nothing because this happened to me. And that's, I think that's how it came out. 
Now, there's also um, an allegation by a player. I'm probably going to screw up his last name, but Mikhail Jordain or Jordain or Jordain, something like that. He's a Czech player. And um, apparently, Peters kicked him in the back and yelled at him, punched him in his head while he was at practice, stuff like that. Now, that, uh, of, I should say first, Aliou's uh, allegations were corroborated by two of his teammates that were in the room. Apparently the room was full anyway. Two teammates that were tracked down corroborated that, so it happened. Rod Brindamore, the coach of the Hurricanes, corroborates and confirms that what Mikhail Jordan is talking about happened. So it happened. I can't see Pe- I can't see Peters keeping his job. Um it's a different day and age. You know, when I was a kid, unfortunately, people had to put up with that garbage. Um, now, let me just sidetrack for a second. I did a vi- I did the two, 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 two podcasts ago, two or three, two, I think. I talked about Don Cherry, where I defended Don Cherry slightly. I defended slightly. His firing only, not what he said. But there's a difference. Don Cherry's an 85-year-old man. He grew up in all of that. It was normal. Does it make it right? Should he learn from it? Yeah, of course he should learn from it. And no, it's not right. But he was 85 years old when he said, you people. He didn't say anything like the N-word. He, I've never heard him say anything like that. I've never heard him use racial slurs. He may say some bigoted stuff in a very mild way. So that's why I defended Don Cherry's firing. I don't defend racial slurs, and I don't defend bigotry. I don't. This is a very different case here, because, I mean, uh, I don't think Bill Bill Peters is that much older than me, if he's older than me at all. Uh, And he should know better. And it shouldn't take 10 years for this stuff to come out, and this guy shouldn't be able to go on to the career he's had, making the money he's made, and a guy like Akeem, just because he's a black person, didn't get a shot. Got sent down to the ECHL after that. Uh, he was a young, tw- apparently he was 20 years old at the time, trying to break his first year in pro hockey. So he didn't feel he had a leg to stand on to complain about it. And besides, eh, sorry, even 10 years ago, well, 10 years ago maybe it wasn't as bad. You could talk, you could speak up against it, but it's horrible. It's horrible what happened, and it's not the same. You can't equate this with Don Cherry. I don't care what you say. Don Cherry never uttered the N-word that I ever heard about, or anything other than sticking up for Canada and Canadians and the Canadian way of life and got getting lost in his patriotism in a bad way, in an inexcusable way. But still, it's not, you know, it's a, there's a difference. And honestly, though, I haven't really heard anybody equating it with Cherry. I'm only talking about it because I talked about Don Cherry. And uh, I, I wanted to address that. So I, I think he should be fired. I think he will be fired. They're investigating. The Flames are investigating uh, exactly what happened. I guess they want to have all their eggs in a row. Is that what they say? All their their dots, their T's, their I's, and t- whatever. Everything's copacetic. There you go. Before they fire him. So they don't get faced with a um, wrongful dismissal um, lawsuit, I imagine. So their lawyers are taking the time just to make sure. So, so, But I think he'll be fired. I think he should be fired. The, question, the only problem with all this is, and here's the only problem I have with it, and I think I'm going to move on after to Mark Babcock after this. It is something he did 10 years ago. More than likely, he's done it many times, and more than likely, he's done it since. So I can't talk for that because nothing's come out. But it begs the question of this. I heard this on Sportsnet, so it's, it, it made me think that, yeah, I kind of agree with that. If when you're, say, tw- you say something when you're a lot younger before you, you may change your opinion, you may whatever, and it's not a good thing, and it's seen by other people or it's heard or whatever the thing is, 20 years later, You might not be, and I'm not saying Bill Peters has changed. I'm not. It's just a question I'm asking. Are you held responsible for what you might have said? Could have been in a joke, taken out of context. You don't know. To lose your job, I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know. 
In this case here, it's been confirmed. I would have to think that Bill Peters has done this many times. He has not come out to say anything about it at all. So maybe they're not letting him, I don't know. He needs to come out and atone for this in some way. No, he won't work again in the NHL, probably not in North American hockey again. Um, but he needs to at least, if he is innocent here, which he's not, but if he has moved on and he's a different person and he would never be like that again, he needs to come out and apologize and explain himself. On Mike Babcock, so we're moving on. On Mike Babcock, I haven't talked about Mike Babcock being fired because he's the coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. I didn't have much to say about it. But there's some new stuff come out since that isn't very <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's why I played the song I played for the intro. <laughs> Very dirty deeds have been done here. So Mike Babcock, apparently, at the time the story came out after his firing, he had asked a rookie uh, a few years ago, a rookie is in his first year, to um, make a list, to go home and make a list of all the players that are on, the fellow players, and I don't know if this was in training camp or during the season, and list them in order of who tries the hardest, who gives it all, all the way down to who has the worst attitude and is, tries the least and all that. Now, Mar um, I almost blew it. So this player, <laughs> I'm sure you all know who it is, so I, I'll say it soon. This player goes home and does that. He's a rookie, doesn't want to upset his coach. He wants to make the team and he wants to do well, whatever the situation is. He's a rookie, so he does it. And then Babcock takes that list, and he goes to, um, I heard the name of who it was. I heard he went to a few of them on the bottom, but he went to apparently one in particular. Um, I'll say who it is, Nazan Kadri, and told him that he was on the bottom of this list, and this guy just, he gave him this list, and he, he busted him on it. That's pretty shitty. That's a pretty damn shitty thing to do, and the only kind of person who would do that is not a very nice person. I would think. Even if it's Mike Babcock and you think he's a great coach and he's an icon and all that, it's not a very nice thing to do. Now, it's come out since that it's Mitch Marner. Mitch Marner's the player in question. He admitted this happened. Mike Babcock has admitted that it happened. He has said it was a bad ch judgment call on his part. He was just trying to motivate Marner, and uh, th that's his excuse. So it's not like, did it happen? It happened. Now, since that's come out, I've watched a few things, and apparently, uh, uh, Mike Babcock, not a nice person. Uh, not a nice person. Um, apparently, his players did not like playing for him. Uh, he's an arrogant, I'm going to say piece of shit. They said worse. Uh, he thinks very highly of himself, likes to take credit when things go well, and point fingers when things don't. Uh, I would imagine the f Mitch Marner is not the first player that he tried that on and can only imagine what other kind of things he's done. But the, the gist of it is, here's a guy that we thought was a really great guy, great coach, great this, great that. Turns out he may not be. I'm not saying this is, a, this is our allegations. I, I don't have any proof of any of this, so no come on my No, this is what I hear. So apparently, yeah, his players didn't like playing for him. Uh, if anybody is on Twitter and saw the comments Mike Commodore said about Mike Babcock, they were really nasty. Might be the reason why. So, Mike Babcock, not a great guy. I'm going to talk about, I don't, really want, I don't know what else to say about it, but I think, oh, I, I did want to say on the fact of him being fired from Toronto, I don't know what they took so long in doing it for. It was obvious he lost the team. Team wasn't playing for for him anymore, and is it a wonder why? Um, and uh, they should have done it probably a while ago. Is Sheldon Keefe the right guy? Don't know. So far, looking like he is. Uh, there's a honeymoon aspect of it. They're going to play well. If Mike Babcock was that hated and that bad a coach at this point, like his arrogance got in the way, uh, Toronto could go on a nice, lo uh, nice. I don't like the least, but they could go on a a, 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 go a really nice for the fans winning streak and uh, and get back up into the um, upper echelons again. Um, because if anything, Babcock was definitely holding them back. Especially this year, for sure, it was obvious. He lost the room. They stopped playing for him. That's it. Point finale. So, 
turns out there's a big problem in this NA, in the NHL. There's a problem being hidden, not talked about, old boys network type of thing. Got to change. It's got to change because players like Akeem Alou, Alou should not be held back because of the color of his skin. It's just it's 2019. This happened in 2010. But I mean, why aren't we beyond this garbage? So I don't know if that if I don't know if that made any sense to you. That's all I want to say about these guys. Um, I will talk about Mike Babcock, though, in a minute, because there's another subject that he's got, but I want to move on. Defense, Habs defense. What do we do with the defense? PK sucks. And the defense, they're giving up almost three and a half goals a game. Something wrong here. It was a problem that we wanted to have addressed. Uh, obviously, bringing in Ben Sherratt wasn't enough. Um, and the penalty kill... Has gone from being, uh, you know, it wasn't the greatest penalty kill last year, but they were they were right around eighty percent, which is decent. Um, and it's become like their power play of last year. It's become almost league worse. At some points, it was league worse, and it's costing them games. And the defense is costing them games. So now I read Brian Wild's call. He has a, a um, column called Call of the Wild. He has also a podcast. I suggest anybody listening, if you want to, he's a local guy here in Montreal, check him out from Global TV. But just call the wild with an E at the end of wild. Brian Wild, also an E at the end of wild. Great. Uh, and he puts it out not too long after. You can go on uh, after the games. Every game, the column comes out within a half hour. Don't know how he does it. Um, and you can get it right off of Twitter. Uh, just go follow him. Brian Wild. And he he points out that Shea Weber has given a, has been on the ice for 16 power play goals against. So PK been on the PK for 16 goals against, tied with the league lead in that department. If you look at um, uh, Thompson, Nate Thompson's stats for the on the penalty kill, they're not great actually. They're really not great. Um, not the first time I've heard it, and it, they're not great. So he's saying this, the NHL is a fast league, why not, oh, first of all, if the people that you have on the penalty kill are not working, why aren't you trying something different? If their stats are showing they're not working, they're not going to contribute, they're not going to be good here, why aren't you trying something different? And he points out that the, NA, that the uh, NHL is a much faster skilled league and therefore you need to do like a lot of other teams are doing and that's put your better players on the penalty kill. Your faster skilled players because they can keep up with the other team's faster skilled players because that's who's on the power play for them. So they can keep up and better manage, um, better manage the, the, uh, the, the attack uh, when they do break up a play and get the puck, they're the fast skilled players. They can maybe transition it into a chance, something, get the puck out, whatever it is. Makes sense to me. Makes sense. Guys like Nick Suzuki, Max Domi, uh, uh, Galley, uh, Tatar. We need these guys starting to play the PK because they're going to hopefully, I think that's going to make the difference. There's Something's got to give there. Something's got to give there. What they're doing, it, look, it's like Einstein's theory of uh, insanity. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting something different to happen, it, you, that's insane. So if you know these guys aren't doing the job, but you keep putting them out, hoping it's going to get better, ho it's not going to get better. We've got to do something different. And one of the reasons it's not going to get better is there's no puck move. There's, there's, who's, a big, who's a good puck-moving defenseman? Mete can move the puck. This is true. Um, after that, Petrie. Petrie and Mete. There, that's it. So you, you don't have enough puck-moving defensemen on this team. It's a big problem. That's why the defense is having, tr having trouble. That's why Montreal's having trouble getting out of their zone. You see them struggle. You sometimes see them running around like they're chickens without their, with their heads cut off. It happened last night. How many times? It's because they don't have the puck-moving guys. 
That's why in the offseason, I, I wanted to get Shane Goss's beer in here. Shane Goss's beer, no matter what you want to think, he's had a fall off. He hasn't had a great start to the season. Yeah, there could be reasons for that that we don't know about. We know that they have a lot of defensemen there, and def- good ones in Philadelphia, and maybe just not room for him. He just never got the opportunity again. Whatever the situation, he doesn't like the coach. Coach doesn't like him. We don't know. That happens. He needs a change of scenery. He's on the market. Bergie should go after him. I would imagine Bergie's talking to them, has had talks with them. I know there's a couple of other teams interested in him. Don't waste time. He's on the market. He's on a, a low part in his career. It's time to get him at a good price. Okay. Um, it's weird because I think I uh, wanted to talk about that after, but you know what? That is That was going to be next. But what I'm going to talk about now I'm sorry, I had a whole plan for a show, and I got no questions from my viewers to answer at the end. I had to put together a show I didn't think I was kind of doing, and it was getting late in the day, and uh, I might not seem as prepared as I can. Sorry. Uh, Okay, so enough of my apologies or my trying to beg you guys. Please keep what? No, I'm not going to do that, but, you know. Okay, so there's calls to fire Mark (laughs) Bergevin. This I see on Twitter. There's calls to fire Bergevin. And it's, they'll all say, oh, it's not because of the moves that he made. I like the moves he's made. He only made a couple of bad trades and blah, blah, blah. But it's the moves he hasn't made, the people he hasn't brought in. Now, that could be true. Yeah, there's a lot of people he, has, he hasn't made a lot of moves and he hasn't brought in. But we don't know the situation. We don't know what the negotiations are like. We don't know what's being asked of Montreal back in return guaranteed they're asking for our good prospects you don't think Cole Caulfield is what on top of everybody's on the tip of their tongues when they want to ask Montreal for a player you know a first round draft pick for next year we have the draft here in Montreal next year sure Bergevin does not want to give that up there's a cost to everything. Remember that. And I don't think a lot of people think think like that. They think, oh, well, we got to get this guy. Bergie should just go and get that guy. He should just go get this. He should do that. Yeah, he should, can do a lot of things if he can just, oh, I want that and get it. doesn't happen like that. The real world doesn't work like that. The other team has to want to give you that guy for a decent price, price you're willing to pay. I'm sure he's been in on a lot of deals that haven't worked out because the price is either too high or something stalls the negotiation, another team gets involved and offers a little more. Never think of that. You know, I'm sure he's not always the only person, the only other team in there interested in a player. So there's a lot of things you've got to think about when you start ripping on a guy for not doing something because it's sometimes well beyond his control. He can get in there and make the offers and, uh, and call, and, but it's not under his control if a team doesn't want to accept his offer. So I, I think he's been very active. I just don't think he's been very successful. Don't forget also a lot of players don't want to come here. They don't want to come here. If it's not just for the tax reasons, it's for the too much. There's stuff for a lot of players, it's too much attention for them. It's too much every day. They can't walk the streets. Their kids and their wives are affected a little bit about the uh, in recognition and being yelled at and screamed at when we're doing bad, you know. Well, you think it's only on Twitter when they lose a game that people go ballistic? If they see them on the street, you don't think they hear about it? I'll say it again. I said it a couple times now, but goes to the old Steve Shutt quote, uh, talking to a rookie, another player. I don't know who it was he was telling this to, but he says, oh, yeah, they love us here in Montreal. They love us here in Montreal, win or tie. But you better not tie too often. And that tells you all there is to know. So it's hard. So uh, does is Bergy, did, were there moves we would have liked him to make that he didn't make? Yeah, of course. Were there moves that he didn't make that he could have made and wanted to make but just decided not to? I doubt it. Kind of dumb. So I don't think he should be fired. I think he's doing a good job. I think he needs to do something here. The, Julian needs to do something. Good coaching here. Get this team going. The players need to look themselves in the mirror here and know that they're better than this and come out and show us something better. They've got to break this slump. The only people who can do it are the players. Coach can do only so much. The general manager can do only so much. 
Uh, I think I saw somewhere Mete was uh, quoted as saying he thinks the solutions are there in the room and the players need to come up with them. Okay, so uh, what was I talking about there? That's Berge. So in light of all this, I'll go on to the next subject, which is out of, t- out of uh, order because I screwed up, but it's the next firing. Everyone wants Julian to be fired. Will Claude Julian be fired? I even had one. Uh, I'm not going to name the name. He knows who he is. Um, and, and it, look, it's a fair question, but I guess you don't, if you don't know that he's the owner, they wanted Jeff Molson to be fired. Well, you can't have Jeff Molson fired. He's not going to fire himself. He owns the team. Not happening. But everybody should be fired. Trade Price, trade Weber, trade this, blow it up. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a slump, guys. It's just a slump. They'll get out of it every damn team, except maybe the odd one. And even the best teams have smaller slumps, but they have slumps like this. Every time, to- every year, every season, you're going to have a slump. You're never going to be on the upswing all the time. It's always going to be. That's what a season's like, a roller coaster. So, should Julian be fired? No, I don't see why he should. Uh, did he get out coached? I don't know if he got out coached so much as the team didn't play well. And they did at the same time. They ran to a hot goalie. They had a bad call early on that deflated them because the fir- two early calls ended up as goals. They came back from the first one, and then the second one I think was a bad one. I was doing a live stream. I wasn't able, I didn't even see the penalty, honestly, so I can't say good or bad. Uh, but from what I can, take, uh, for, can tell from the comments that I've seen about it, it was a bad call. It deflated the team. Boston took advantage of it completely and then each goal that came after and each save that Halak made it deflated them and that's what you see that happens it's nothing it's not the end of the world season's not over it's game 24 <laughs> still 58 games left to go game season's not over what are they going to do roll over for the rest of the se- the season i don't think so so is firing Julian going to make a difference? The only way I could say firing Julian would make a difference if in Montreal we were allowed to bring in any coach, any coach that's the best one out there, then I would say, you know what, maybe firing the coach would work. But we're not allowed to do that here in Montreal. We have to have a guy who could speak French and English, a guy that can speak to the reporters and speak to whatever, has to speak French. So we're limited. We can't just fire a guy like Julian because is there somebody better that can fill that that qualification right now there's not and I don't think Julian should be fired anyway I don't think it's more than a slump we're still at the same spot we were last year same points same record the key here is right now as much as I I said the last two games they've got to respond get these two points puts us ahead well they didn't right now how do they respond after that loss how do they come back against the devils this is what's key right now if this is just a slump, they will come back with a good game. They'll work it out. You'll, you'll notice a better play. It's against the Devils. We should win. We should. Um, so that the reaction now is how, what you want to see. Does this team have the character that we thought they had, that they showed us in their last win against Washington? We're going to find out because that's what, that's what I'm looking for. So, no, I don't think Claude Julian should be fired, and I really I don't think he will be fired right away. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, right now. Next up, Nick Suzuki. Um, in light of the game against the uh, Senators, when him and Thomas Tatar kind of just, and in the overtime, the goal that cost them the game, um, they kind of seem to like look at each other, like, "Are you going to you you going back to cover that?" It was a lazy ass move by a rookie. And by a veteran. Both to blame. Incident one. Against the Rangers. And I didn't rewatch the Rangers game to prove this. But I know it caught me on at least two occasions. I watch. Because I keep my eye on Nick Suzuki as much as I can. I like to watch this kid. And I want to see stuff I can talk about with him. Well. I saw a couple of occasions where I said to myself. Oh. Come on. Like hurry up. Like, show some hustle. React faster. So I don't know if what... And then he was a minus four against Bruins. Although I imagine everybody was a minus. But um, there's talk about whether Julian's going to (laughs) be 
calling him out, like throwing him and Mete under the bus or whatever. So my question is just one little point, and it's been something that's been dogging him, I guess, for a couple of years now. Is he a bit lazy? So I worry about this one aspect of his game because the other aspects of his game, none of it really worries me. But this one particular does, thing does. He used to also be, they said that he's a perimeter player. I don't see the perimeter player in his game. So that doesn't bother me. I think he does get in there. He goes to the corners. I don't see him being a, per, a perimeter player anymore if he was before I started watching him. But this little aspect of him being a little lazy at times, not all the time, there's not all the time, but there's been a lot of talk, it's been going on for a while, that he doesn't hustle enough. He looks like he's not taking it seriously, seriously enough. And um, I argue back that, you know, the game kind of slows down for him. It kind of looks like that, especially in the OHL. Oh, my God. There are games where it almost was like the game would be going on fast, fast, fast. The puck gets to Suzuki's stick, and it's like it went into slow motion till it leaves his stick, and then it speeds up again. Um, but I'm noticing this odd incidence here. And when I think back, it's not just the Rangers game. It's not just the Senators game. There are times in every single game where he has either a brain fart moment. I don't know what you want to call it. Hey, I haven't dropped any F-bombs. Um, or just his concentration isn't 100% there. His focus isn't 100% there for the full 60 minutes. But so I, you guys keep an eye on it too. I'm going to keep my eye on that. But I think there might be signs that Nick Suzuki can have a tendency sometimes, the odd time here and there, to have a lazy play. And it's not a good look. Next up, I want to talk about Brendan Gallagher, but all in a good way. Did you see that slap shot from Shea Weber's stick that he took right on a part I'm not exactly sure where it hit him, but they said it was a part that's not really heavily padded. So and it seemed to me somewhere around his hip area. It hurt. <laughs> it was obvious it hurt. He barely got back to the bench. But my God, this guy came out. I think he may have missed one shift. Maybe one. I don't think he left the bench. And he was back out and didn't even notice that he had gotten hit. This guy has... What character? He's got a never-give-up attitude. And um, I've been calling this since before Shea Weber was named captain, but he's the next captain of the Montreal Canadiens. I just wanted to just give a shout-out to, Sh to Brendan Gallagher for taking that Shea Weber slap shot, gritting his teeth, getting to the bench, and then coming out and playing and showing what kind of a... Here's my F-bomb. Showing what kind of a fucking character guy this guy is. Love this guy. Heart and soul of this hockey team. He shows it how often every season, and he showed it again last night. He's heart and soul. That, if you're a rookie or a young guy on this team, you see Gallagher take a shot like that, be in a pain that he was obviously in, and come back two shifts later, if not the next shift, two shifts later, and play the rest of the game. You can't. You have to, you have to, you have to nut up and do... Similar. So, I love this guy. Okay. So, I was saying this is a slump, and it is. I just want to see. I can't see the time. Oh, good. This is a slump, and we are a young team. Most of this team is under 25 years of age. A good, good, important part of this team is ranges from 19 to 24 years old. It's a young team. With a young team, you got to take the good with the bad. Got to take the good with the bad. They're going to make mistakes. They got to they gotta make mistakes in order to learn from the mistakes. Can't learn if you don't make mistakes. You can get coached all you want. But when you get out there, just because the guy taught you how to do this, do that, doesn't mean you're going to perform that perfectly. It's a rare player that does that. So, you know, I don't know what people are expecting. There's going to be mistakes. We're going to have games where we lose because of the young team. It's going to happen. That's how a slump goes around, comes around. That's what happens. And then this young team learns how to deal with adversity. And when they learn how to deal with adversity, you got players like Brendan Gallagher. Got hit in, in so much pain, gets hit like that. He, that's adversity. You're losing the damn game. You're one of the guys counted on to come back and win. What did he do? Came back out and he tried. 
That's adversity. You don't, you don't get to that point and be a player like that without making mistakes and having to answer back for them. So for all the people that just go and, you know, you got to make changes, trade this guy, this guy, that guy. No, these guys need to play and they need to get better and they need to learn. Now, on to Carey Price. Is Carey Price to blame? Is he to blame for this losing streak? Is he to blame for the loss last night? Um, I say no. There were they, he had he had on the defensive side of the game last night. Montreal was putrid. Sure, they had some offense. They got the most shots. They had a lot of chances. They hit a ba- um, a, a hot goalie. Was Carey Price to blame? No, they left him alone to die out there. Him and uh, and Kincaid after. So. Everyone who's on Carey Price to trade him, he's finished, he's done, he's overpriced, he's over this. You know, it's fine, it's your opinion. He's not done, and he's not to blame. Okay, usually I end my podcast with with viewer questions, but guess what? I got two questions. One's from Habination, but it's the same question you asked me last year, and ex- except for out- having, uh, uh, what's his name, Irving Grunman. Uh, as the one of the GMs, uh, Ray Jean Hull, Irving Grunman, Mark Bergevin, who's better. So he put Ronald Corey in for Irving Grunman. Answer's the same, Mark Bergevin. And then uh, Joe asked me a question on the chat, and I asked him to put it in the comments. He didn't. And when I went back to view the video to see, the chat also wasn't available, so I couldn't even find it from there. So no viewer questions. If you want that to change, you got to leave me comments in the... You guys know the score, so if you want to do that, I can't help it. Otherwise, I come up with a come up with my own. So um, I ran a little longer than I wanted to do on this one. I hope it was entertaining enough. Um, it was really just put together today. That's what I try to do. Nice and dirty, dirty deeds. Well, my dirty podcast as raw and from up here as I can give it to you guys. So it's now the penalty box. Look for it. Please like and subscribe. That's down there. And you can ring the notification bell and you'll get more. Sorry if I swore a little bit. Not too much. Wasn't bad. Um, Hope my points of view got across. If not, hope I didn't ramble too much. Hope I was entertaining enough. Probably wasn't. But hey, I'm trying. And uh, hopefully you'll show up next time. So um, next Wednesday, get some stories. Talk about them. And you guys just got to stand there and listen. Or stand, you can sit. You can ride in your car. You can do exercise. You can cook. Whatever you want. You just got to listen. That's all. That's why I'm here. So that's the penalty box. Before I just... I don't know what I'm saying. So that's the penalty box. Check it out next week. Uh, check out my videos. They're coming up. Games are coming up. We're playing the uh, Devils on wednesday and uh, that's it so have a great one everybody uh before i close it up uh, go habs go see you on the next video bye y'all